Hello viewers, welcome back to the lab. Uh, so some of you might have seen the Olivetti Netstrada restoration that I did a, um, a few videos ago. Um, that was a dual uh, slot one Pentium 2 system that I uh, did a full restoration on. Um, I was uh, really enjoyed that one and it brought back a lot of memories for me. So uh, I've, I've been off and I've been into the attic and I've got an old um, Pentium 166 system just down just down here whirring away and I've uh, it's got it, that's running Windows 98 but it got me remembering all the things that I used to do with um, 486s and stuff like that playing Doom and all all that and I started to get a bit nostalgic for a 486 so I did a very dangerous thing I started looking around on eBay uh, just to see what might be out there and I came across a listing um, that had a complete 486 um, the archetypal beige box um, up for sale. I initially saw it and thought, oh, that's a lot of money. Um, it was listed up for 150 quid. Um, I, was, I started thinking that's a lot of money for an old an old PC. Um, but then I, was, I had a few beers, which is also a bit dangerous. And uh, I started adding up all the details about what the seller had listed about this system. And I started thinking, actually, it's maybe not that far off the mark all the parts in this probably add up to about um, what you'd pay in individual parts um, second hand anyway. So I went and bought it and here it is. It was listed as a 486DX20 um, and as you can see on the front we've got a CD-ROM drive, uh, five and a quarter inch floppy, that, so that'll be a 1.2 megabyte, um, a three and a half inch floppy. Um, I really like the case on this uh, because it's still got the turbo switches reset and the speed display, which um, I always loved having them. Always loved having those. So if we have a quick look at the uh, this little spec sheet that the seller stuck to it, um, we've got a 486DX20. Uh, we have SIMS, which is obvious for a 486. Uh, we've got one 8 meg 72 pin SIM and four 1 meg 30 pin SIMs to give us a total. 12 meg, 260 meg hard disk, IDE of course, motherboard, well it says Opti but that's the chipset so we'll have to try and identify the actual board manufacturer, uh, power supply 200 watts, well, that's quite quite beefy actually for, the, for a 486, um, graphics card, Sirius Logic, blah blah blah, um, ISA, um, blah, blah, blah. and we have uh, just off the camera here, we have, oh, oh there's me invoice. <laughs> Uh, we've got um, a 3Com Etherlink 3 ISO LAN card, so that's, that's kind of nice to have. So let's take the lid off this and we'll have, actually have a look at it properly. Now I should say that I have been in this already, I've checked out most of it. Um, it does power on, it, it posts, it boots off floppy drive uh, to DOS and the hard disk seems to be fine. That's, um, that's really all I've checked. Um, it's a bit dusty on the inside. Uh, the two things I haven't checked is the CD-ROM drive and the five and a quarter inch floppy because when I took the lid off and had a look around um, it was quite clear that everything's just caked in dust so um, that's probably going to need a clean before I can use that anyway. So let's take the lid off this. Even that sound brings back memories. Now, one of the things I really liked about um, this area was this size of case, uh, the Baby AT style. I really, really liked. It was just two five and a quarter inch uh, bays and two three and a half, and an internal hard disk. I always liked this form factor. It was just, it was just so compact. Uh, so we've got a power supply uh, there. We've got the CD-ROM drive in the top, the five and a quarter inch floppy drive, the three and a half, and then the hard disk uh, with all the ribbon cables as you'd expect. So when this originally arrived I was kind of expecting a pretty low spec uh, 486 and um, indeed the CPU does, it, it's not actually a 20 megahertz as the seller had listed, it's actually a 33. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's a DX or an SX because the BIOS doesn't actually differentiate so uh, I don't only really be able to find out by taking the heatsink off the CPU. But the thing that really made me happy when I took the lid off this, um, is those brown sockets down there. Um, yes, this is a Visa Local Bus uh, 486, which means it's one of the later ones. Um, and if you just spy around the uh, motherboard there, 
I can definitely see uh, jumper settings and legends for a DX4. So um, this should make for a really nice upgradable system. Um, so I, I should be able to drop a DX4 100 into this and really give this a bit of a speed boost. So what I'm going to do is just take out all the cards, take out everything because it's all going to need to be taken out and cleaned properly. Nice to see this is complete with its CD audio connection. Uh, so we've got an ISA sound card, an Aztec. I can't remember off the top of my head whether these are any good or not. Um, I, couldn't, I, I always bought sound blasters in the day, so I always try to avoid the clone cards, but uh, we'll certainly give that a try. I'm sure it works. Um, So we've got a, a 3Com Etherlink 3. Um, so yeah, that's very handy to have actually, very handy. If I remember rightly, these local bus cards were always a bit of a problem to get in and out. There you go. So we have a Cirrus Logic GD5428. Bit dusty, it's going to need a bit of a clean that one. Um, it's got space for a RAM upgrade, so it's probably a one meg one. Um, I seem to remember one meg was a thing and then upgradable to two. I can't the memory is a little bit misty, <laughs> I have to admit. So we've got the game and the 25 pin serial port. Let's start popping wires off here. So this is the um, Super I.O. card. Um, I remember these were, uh, once these Super I.O. cards came out, it just made life so much easier um, when you were doing stuff with old PCs. Um, because, you know, back in the day, you'd, you'd need a separate card for your floppy controller and a separate card for your hard disk controller and a separate card for your um, serial ports and to have the, the, it all combined onto just one card made life so much easier and of course uh, when when all these devices got integrated into uh, the um, the north and south bridges it just made life even easier that board is not secured very well to the case so we'll have to rectify that when we put it back together so the Super I.O. card is a UMC chipset. Again, could do with a bit of a clean, but generally it looks in pretty good condition. Okay, so we can see the motherboard a bit better now. Uh, we have a model number, it's a V4P895R3 slash SMT version one. And uh, looking that up on the interwebs, uh, that is made by QDI. Um, there's manuals available, so yeah, that's uh, that's great that we've got uh, the manual. So yeah, we can see there the uh, four one meg, uh, thirty pin sims, and the um, eight meg, seventy two pin sim there. Um, I'm going to guess that that is fast page mode um, and not EDO. Actually, was EDO a thing on four eight six? Um, either way, I do have um, some sixteen meg sims that I can put in there so I could probably take this to 32 meg um, take these 30 pin sims out um, and just use 272 pin right let's stand this up and I will remove the rest of the bits out and then we'll take the motherboard out
and there we have just the metal chassis so uh, that's everything apart uh, and ready to be cleaned what i'm going to do is have a quick look at the motherboard see if there's any issues that i can see with it a pretty typical layout it's nice to have the cpu and the uh, ram up at the top um, it means that anything that plugs in here um, doesn't get fouled by um, heat sinks and fans and stuff you sometimes saw uh, on 486 local bus systems you saw the CPU round this sort of area um, and sometimes it obstructed cards that you wanted to plug in so it's nice to see that up there uh, we have one two three four five six seven ISA slots uh, with six of them being 16-bit we've got three local bus slots uh, the cache RAM the opti chipset obviously and all the capacitors bar one are tantalums so that's really nice to see um, i'll probably change that electrolytic over there because uh, even if it doesn't need changing there's only one of them and it'll only take a few moments to change so uh, that's probably well worth swapping that out for a new one um, the tantalums you don't have to worry about unless they explode uh, in terms of getting an accurate date code off this um, the chipset has a date code of 9428 um, so midway through 1994 it's also nice to see we've got a CR2032 um, RTC battery um, and not one of those stupid Dallas things right let's take a quick look at the floppy drives the three and a half inch drive seems to be really nice condition um, apart from the yellow plastics on the front I've had the top off this and it looks fine on the inside so don't really need to, need to do any cleaning so that should be good to go as it is and I do know that is working uh, the same can't be said for the five and a quarter. Um, yeah, it's absolutely filthy. Uh, you can see inside there. Come on, camera. Um, you can see inside there there's just piles and piles of dust and gunk and all sorts of stuff. So we're going to need to take the top off that and give it a really good clean. So, yeah, you can see it's absolutely... Uh, thick in dust um, obviously this is uh, it was quite common at the time um, the five and a quarter is one of those devices that doesn't have a little flap on the front door and um, the power supply fan just sucks all the dust straight through the five and a quarter inch floppy drive so yeah we're going to need to uh, do some cleaning out here um, I'll probably take the air duster to this get the get the most of it out Okay, so I've been over this with the air duster. It looks uh, a lot, lot better, but there does seem to be a little bit more dust up inside underneath uh, this cover, uh, which is basically the area where the floppy disk uh, pushes into. So I think I might remove that. Right, so that's the five and a quarter inch drive reassembled. I actually opted to take out the heads. There were some spots that I couldn't get to to clean out, clean out properly and um, the dust seemed to be quite sticky. So I wanted to get uh, everything cleaned out. So uh, that uh, the heads have actually been removed, um, but shouldn't affect the alignment, I don't think. Right, uh, let's take a look at the CD-ROM drive. Um, I would imagine it should be pretty clean in here because it's far more sealed than the uh, five and a quarter inch floppy so let's just whiz the top off this so yeah it does look pretty clean in there i'm going to give the laser um the lens a, a quick clean just to make sure there's no dust on it um, but i don't think there's really much to much to do in here Okay, before I put this together, I just thought I'd have a quick test um, just to see whether it spins up the disc, and it doesn't. Um, so, yeah, I think we do have a bit of a problem here. Put the disc in. The insert eject stuff works. I can hear the laser moving about. 
uh, but there's no spin on the disc. Yeah, I've had a look down here where the connector is for it. I can't really see anything that might be might be uh, obviously failed. Um, yeah, more than likely, it's probably the driver the driver chip probably under this little heatsink here. Uh, it's not worth fixing this, to be honest. It's a bit of a shame because it does match the rest of the system, but uh, I'm sure I can find some kind of alternative to use, at least temporarily. Um, and I might look to, to try and source uh, possibly a, a similar era drive that uh, wouldn't look out of place. Right, let's see what horrors await us in the power supply. Yeah. I'm hoping it's just going to be very dusty. Um, but uh, bad caps could be a thing. We do know it works, but uh, obviously if there's bulging caps, they're going to need to be replaced. So let's see what we have. Ugh. That is pretty filthy. So here we are after the air duster, and you can see it's come up really nice. Um, a lot of that was just accumulation of dust. Uh, so I've given it a bit of a clean up, uh, given the wires a clean. Looks really nice. Um, can't see any issues at all, so I think I'm just going to leave this one as it is. Uh, put the lid back on, and we should be good to go. Okay, I think we can probably start thinking about reassembly. Um, now, before I do that, uh, we're just going to have a quick look at the motherboard, uh, because we're going to do um, some upgrades to it. Now, originally this was 12 meg and had a 486DX33 on it. So we're going to give that a little upgrade. Um, in my little box here, we have oh, DX4. I, had, uh, I definitely had one of these in the day. Uh, it wasn't an Intel one. It was one of the AMD... Um, DX4s. Uh, I can't remember whether it was a, a 4100 or a 120. I'm not 100% which one it was, but I wanted to put an Intel in this uh, just because I've always liked Intel. So I went for an Intel DX4. Um, unfortunately, this is the right through cache version, so it's not quite as fast as it could be, but um, this should be fine. It should uh, run things quite nicely. And in addition to that, I've got two uh, 16 meg fast page mode. Um, 72 pin sims which are going to go in nicely to give me 32 megabytes uh, which is tons for a machine of this age. Uh, they came courtesy of one of my old uh, Quantel uh, CPU boards so it's kind, of, it's kind of cool that I'm putting a little bit of Quantel stuff into uh, 486. Now originally I was going to show you the process of going through and changing all the little jumper settings to make to configure the board uh, for the processor, but as it turns out, it's completely set up for a DX4100. A um, little bit odd. I mean, most of it would be the same anyway, because it is an Intel chip. Um, the bus speed is currently at 33, so that would all be fine. Uh, but there are jumpers there to say it's a DX4. And for some reason, those have been set um, as it was as I took it to bits. So I'm not sure what was going on there. Um, maybe this had a DX4100 in it and somebody swapped it out um, or they it was some kind of vain attempt at overclock, overclocking the DX33 but suffice to say there's nothing to change so all I need to do is pop this out and then get our nice DX4 now I've, got, I've had a rummage round I did manage to find an old 486 heatsink that I've had before um, so we'll use this the moment that can go in there and uh, now we can install our 16 megabyte sims one in there one in there I always give them a bit of a wiggle first just to make sure they're nice and seated. And uh, before I forget to mention it, I did change that capacitor there, the only electrolytic on the board, and uh, removed the old one. Um, it wasn't bad, but it's not great either, so it was probably a good idea to change that. 
Right, so as we've given the CPU a bit of a boost, uh, we're going to need to change the uh, display on the front. Uh, now these are pretty basic devices. Um, I remember configuring a few of these back in the day. Um, it's basically it just takes power and it's got a bunch of LEDs and a load of jumpers on the back which just control um, whether certain digits come on or off depending on the button. So I've got all the wiring out here uh, out of the case because I haven't put, reassembled it yet. So this is the uh, turbo switch that's normally on the front of the case. Uh, this is the bit that plugs into the motherboard and that is literally just a separate um, connection to the switch um, and the switch then switches both the motherboard and this just to flip between two different numbers. Uh, now we don't have the instructions for this obviously but it shouldn't be too hard to figure out. Uh, the jumpers on the back will basically be in one of four positions. Uh, with no jumper on the display is just going to be completely blank. Um, or that segment is going to be blank. Um, then there'll be one position where it's on regardless of the switch position, so it'll be on permanently. And there'll be one where um, it'll be on if the switch is in, and the other way will be um, off when it's in. So um, you just go through and um, set the jumpers whichever way you need them to be. Um, so we're going to have to do a bit of fiddling around just to figure out which digits are what and um, what positions need to go where. Now I've got this connected up to my bench power supply, so um, I'm just going to put 5 volts onto it, and we should get 33, there we go, so that was the original speed. A few moments later. So there we go, uh, we've got that uh, configured between 8 and 100. Um, took a little bit of fiddling around, um, basically what I wanted to do in the end was just to remove everything and start again. Uh, so you end up with no display, you put one on and see what uh, what positions you get. So. Um, that is now configured, so um, in the out position um, it's going to be the slow speed and then when it's clicked in to turbo it's 100. Right, so we have the front panel reassembled with all the uh, wires and LEDs, switches and all that put back in. Um, I just need to put a little bit of glue on the back of these LEDs because they um, it's only a very light push fit and they, they were actually glued in originally anyway. So. I'm just going to dab a little bit of hot glue on those to hold them in and uh, then we should be good to put this onto the case. Now uh, one thing I noticed when I uh, removed the case is there was this slight bit of damage up in the top here. Now thankfully uh, the bit of plastic which fits in there was actually still attached. It literally just fell off as I touched it so um, this should be fairly easy to, to glue back into place. Right, so we've got all the bits together. Um, I think I've pretty much cleaned and done everything that I need to do to all the bits in here. So um, I've got the case partially reassembled. Uh, so we're going to do the final bit of the build now. Um, now, one thing I meant to mention about that um, CD-ROM drive which wasn't working. I, I had a rummage around and I do have this. It's a DVD drive and it's black and it's so not going to be in keeping with the rest of the system because at the moment I'm not going to consider uh, retro brighting this. Um, I'm going to enjoy the mellow yellow, uh, mainly because I don't have a setup for doing retro brighting. So I wanted something that was going to be in keeping with the rest of the lovely yellowness and um, I had a rummage around, couldn't find anything. So I ended up buying something off eBay. So I've actually pick this drive up which is not quite period but it looks pretty of the of the time um, you know it's, it's got the headphone thing and the volume control and all that so it looks pretty pretty similar um, you'd think it would come from a similar era um, and it's got uh, all the all the right bits on the back so I'm going to swap the non-working drive for this one which does work thankfully and it's nearly the, sh the same shade of yellow <laughs>
Wow, uh, yeah, it's just a sea of wires. So much for cable management, eh? Uh, right, okay, I think uh, probably best thing to do is power this on, check, make sure everything's working. Then I might try and tidy this up a little bit. Right, so as you can probably hear, I've got this powered on. It uh, is all working pretty much okay. Booted up fine, I've got DOS on it, I've got Doom on it and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, that's all working fine. Um, I've uh, tidied up some of the cables in here as well just to make it a bit neater. It always was a bit of an issue, especially with these IDC cables. You could never tidy them up um, easily. Uh, now, one issue that I have run across is the um, Aztec sound card that I was uh, that came in this originally and I've reused. Um, that does seem to have a bit of an issue. Um, I've never seen never seen this issue before and basically it's a bit schizophrenic about its IRQ setting. So it's a bit frustrating. You fire, you fire up Doom and the, um, and the digital audio is working and the next time you run it, it's not. And it's, you find that it's switched from IRQ5 to IRQ7. It's just bizarre. I've um, been through all the configuration utility for the, uh, the sound card and uh, yeah, it, it just doesn't make any difference at all. Um, and there's nothing else in here that's using IRQ5 or 7, which it seems to keep switching to. Uh, so I uh, don't know what's going on uh, wrong on, on that. Um, there is a jumper on it, uh, which allows you to change between software setting and EEP ROM setting. There is a configuration utility which allows you to um, set the the base port, the RQs, DMA, and all that sort of stuff. And you run that, and that seems fine. Everything seems to get saved. It probably gets saved in. Um, the EEP ROM. So you'd expect that you'd be using EEP ROM settings all the time once you've configured it, but it, it keeps changing. Whatever you do, it just keeps changing randomly. Um, possibly the EEP ROM is dead in it. That's a possibility. But um, to be honest, I actually have a, a Pentium 166 system, which I very, very rarely use. Um, and that's got a Sound Blaster all 64 value in. So I might forego the um, OPL3 um, sounds and go with um, an all 64 card in this. Um, I'll give that a try at some point. But yeah, a bit frustrating that the card that came with it doesn't seem to be really working properly. Right, so this is really, really excellent. Um, I've got myself a nice working 486 again. Uh, it's been a long, long time since I've had one. So, uh, really happy. I think I might uh, do a bit of gaming first. And uh, I'm actually tempted a little bit to go away and learn a bit of C. I've never really learned C before. And I just wonder, maybe be doing it on some old school hardware and software? I don't know. Uh, we'll, we'll give it a try. Okay, I hope you enjoyed watching this one. Um, if you did, give it a thumbs up. Comments always welcome down in the comments section. Thanks to all my loyal patrons who always help and support this channel. Thank you very much indeed. So, thanks for watching and I will see you on the next video. Bye for now.